Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. You have been following the Jan 6 trials, haven't you? Where the select committee of congressmen and women from both parties, interestingly, the ones representing the Rep uh, Republican Party are those who are not in consonance with the ex-president of United States, Donald Trump. There is a committee weighing in on who said what and who shall be punished. And today we had Steve Bannon, uh, uh, president, uh, president Trump's advisors, and some say the man who helped him get elected. Uh, being uh, going through his testimony. We don't know what the outcome of that, but we have Sasha Gong with us who has actually talked to Steve Bannon in the past. And let's welcome Sasha because she did an exclusive interview with him. And we are going to share some snippets of that conversation as we go through this one. So this is something that is very important because it shows us what is happening in the Republican Party as well as in the Democratic Party, the, especially the reluctance or, or the vehement reluctance, I should say, to admit that something went wrong during these elections by the Democrats. You wouldn't say that. I mean, there are there are inconsistencies. It's scary staring at you. Anyway, let's welcome the guest of the afternoon, Sasha Gong. Sasha, Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. Thank you so much. And this is a, a little bit touchy subject because I have to disclose that Steve Bannon and I are very good, well, well, very good friends for a while. So the, this interview, uh, we are going to play some clips. It's results from he interviewed me. So I was in his film and I interviewed him, which, you know, I plan to make a film on U.S.-China relations that end up with, you know, uh, a very, very long, several very long interviews. And today we are playing a part of that interview. And this part of the interview is not about the Republican Party or Democratic Party, but about a very important issue, Trump's China policy. That was the focus of my interview. And uh, I'm going to, you know, I have cut the interview, this short segments, not that short, that's more than 10 minute segments into uh, eight parts and each part address one important issue and especially this part you know something i think the press were very interested but he never actually talked about the to the press about this was his close uh, was his meeting his very important meeting with top chinese leaders before we introduce you to the clip, my interview, we have to understand what happened to Steve Bannon. He's on the news a lot. And um, uh, everybody knows the January 16, uh, January 16 committee, they're investigating. And uh, well, uh, the information says uh, Donald Trump called Steve Bannon either a, a few days before uh, January 16, January 16, or on the day so the January 16 committee wants to interview him wants him to testify and he said i have executive privilege i'm not supposed to talk about what my discussion with the president and then they sent him a subpoena and actually he just threw the subpoena away he refused to answer so uh, the committee unprecedentedly which you know, did not happen like that for a long time i think the last time was in the 50s so they they charge him the justice department charged him for uh in contempt of congress which well two counts of contempt in, in contempt of congress and which you know uh would if he's found guilty would be each count 30 days to one year in jail and fine up to a uh, hundred thousand dollars so that means steve bannon is facing maximum two years in jail and uh two hundred thousand dollar fine right so and uh the trial started on monday and this is what he said to the public on tuesday let's play the first video 
or send somebody like Shifty Shift. We have a constitutional crisis in this nation right now, and they're charging me with a crime. The total and complete illegitimacy of Joe Biden. Trump won. Joe Biden is illegitimate. Benny Thompson is a total, absolute disgrace. That's a short clip, but yes, we can all yes. we can we all see how in contempt it's to the to the entire trial. He called that the show trial. We all know the show show trial is a special special term used for, to describe uh, uh, Stalin's trial, the show trial. So Steve Bannon called that a show trial. And um, in my view, uh, in my view, Steve Bannon, uh, well, he, in this case, I'm not saying in all cases, in this case, one way or another, he will be the winner. Why? If he wins the cases, he wins, he's the winner. If he loses the cases and it even goes to jail, he will be the martyr of the Republican Party. So one way or another, Steve Bannon, who came from almost like political death to the center of the stage, which, you know, uh, I used to joke with him, he had nine lives, and this is another <laughs> life, <laughs> political lives. So. Sasha, before we go into the other clips that you're going to share, um, that we are going to share, I kind of want to know your view of the role Steve Bannon played in getting Trump elected. There, there are, you know, this is the man who I consider was the brains behind, whether you call it chutzpah or what, but he was the one who essentially uh, came, you know, like a surprise and, and defeated uh, Hillary Clinton. And there's a lot of planning that went into it in the back. I don't know much. If you know a little bit, when did you know um, Steve Bannon first? And then, um, uh, and then, just you can walk us through what your experience was. Yeah, two thousand nine. I was part of the Tea Party movement, and I met, I met Andrew Breitbart, and Steve Bannon was with him. I think it was a CPAC meeting or something like that. It's a big meeting, and uh, uh, he's quite impressive, very articulate. So the next time I met him was uh, in during the Republican convention in 2016. And I think it was in Michigan, right? <laughs> yeah, I right. was there, I was leading a team to cover the entire convention. So Steve Bannon was just named, uh, well, no, he was not yet named. He was about to be named camp Trump's campaign manager. And in that, you know, all these party conventions, you always have reporters go to this meeting rooms and they have cocktail and something like that. And I saw Paul Manafort there and Steve Bannon and Kelly and Conway I met years ago. Anyway, the long Republican, you know, history, long history there. And the later I, I met him again and became friends. And when he was making his film, Trump at War, I was one of his interviewees. He interviewed about a dozen people. So, uh, well, we had, because I sent out a request to him. I said, I want to interview you. And uh, they, sent, they sent back a message to me. He said, well, uh, on this day this morning, would you come? So, and I thought I brought a cameraman with me. I thought I would interview him. And he said, no, 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 you're wrong. I'm interviewing you. So <laughs> with reciprocity and later I interviewed him and we, we, we talk a lot, we became friends. So we show up in different shows together, something like that. <laughs> So, so Trump wins. He has a very important position, Steve Bannon, in his cabinet. And after a year or two, Bannon quit. Do you know what happened? No, not a year or two. Only a few months. Oh, few what months, I know, okay. yeah, it's not, what I yeah. What well, Trump got to the White House in January uh, uh, twenty seventeen, yes. January twentieth, he was sworn in. Right, Bannon left the White House in. Uh, uh sometime in in august so only a few months from what i know about steve bannon steve bannon is one of the most 
brilliant thinkers. He read a lot, he likes reading, and he thought at a global level. He's really a big time thinker. He's not the small thinker, small thing. Sometimes I, I, I think he's kind of a big boy is thinking of he's playing some game, but he's quite a brilliant thinker. But he's also one of the worst executor I have ever met. Whatever he promised, it would not get done, <laughs> that's all. So I, 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 I was in a few projects with him, I, I know exactly. He would promise you the whole world, but nothing gets done. And I think that gets him in trouble in the White House. And yet, well, on the one hand, you have to, to say he's really the brain of, he could, Trump had great intuition. Trump understands how things work, how business work, Word work and he also understands what's the common sense. But Bannon is the one who put everything in theory, in contact. So his populism, his populism, his, uh, well, the way he expressed, he's a brilliant communicator, very brilliant. But on the other hand, had I been in a CEO and, or a president, whatever, in that position, I would not have him working for me. I would have him talking to me. <laughs> that's, <laughs> the, that's, my, that's my experience. Winning the presidency of the United States is one of the hardest things that you can do. And Trump had his share of controversies, you know, several marriages, failed marriages, successful marriages, several affairs all sorts of, you know, uh, accusations to somehow lead him through all that and get him elected must be right up there. So Steve Bannon to me was the one person who, well, maybe others were there, Paul Manafort and others. But we have to remember that Trump is an outsider to politics. Forget about Republican or Democrat. He was a businessman and he came in and, and to a large extent, the, Steve Bannon had a role in that. So Sasha, if you have to put your finger on the one thing that Steve Bannon did that made president eminently electable, what would that be? He understand common people. That's the most important thing. Steve Bannon comes from a working class family. He understands how common people think and that he, he can communicate. He can help, he also helped Trump to communicate his ideas to to common people. I have been following uh, elections and especially 2016, I, I, I travel most of the country to follow all the candidates. And, uh, you know, well, Trump rallies are fun. Why are they fun? Because he knows how to communicate. Hillary Clinton, on the other hand, is a lousy communicator. She tried very hard, good students, she can repeat whatever, but you, when you listen to her, you don't know what is from her heart. But Trump is on the other hand, and you know, doesn't matter what the good thing or the bad thing and a lot of things I don't like, but you know it's from his heart. So when you look at Steve Bannon, and uh, he's also, he also appears quite sincere when you, talk to him and uh, well on top of that he's a big thinker that's very important if you think of trump's victory it was several things you know uh that on the managing campaign side kellyan conway was a very capable person in dealing with the practical stuff and uh bannon was the brain but had no, well, the Washington saying is that he could not manage a two-car funeral. <laughs> two-car funeral. <laughs> so let's talk about the first um, uh, thing that, you, you know, we, we wanted to discuss, mm -hmm. which is Steve Bannon, the architect of the Trump-China policy. Even though he was not in the White House, the policy did, in fact, get implemented, isn't it? Yes. And the policy was formed in 2015, actually. Uh, this is what I heard. I have 
long interviews with Steve Bannon and I talked to him many, many times. So here's what he told me. And he was thinking of China, you know, these China policies, Trump type China policy in 2013. And when he was in a good, well, friendship with uh, Senator Jeff Sessions, who later became the justice uh, from Attorney General. Yes, so yes. In the Trump thought, administration, well, correct. Yeah. Yeah. They were thinking, you know, uh, the trade issue got to be essential because Americans need to have jobs. And in order to help the American working class have jobs, you have to do two things. One is you have to you know, reduce the China import and China stealing our jobs. That's first. On the, the other things that have to stop illegal immigrants, which takes a lot of American jobs. Anyway, so they came up two issues. They believe whoever, whoever, you know, whichever candidate could pick up the issues would be a winner. So in 2015, he, saw, he met Trump in, in the meeting. Well, I, I think they know each other a little bit before, but he, he and Trump sit down and talk. And uh, so Bannon presented his idea. He said, well, we have to have this China stay and uh, take, get our jobs back to the States and the in illegal immigrant. And Trump said, that must be another issue. One more issue. What's another issue? Stop all these unnecessary wars. So that became what they call the tripod of the Trump policy. Trade war to get jobs back to the States and stop illegal immigrants and stop unnecessary war. And if you look at the entire Trump policy, that is, that's it, the three, the, the tripod policy. And you, without them, that, that become what people call the Trump doctrine. So what's, well, Steve Bannon in, on this, in this way had a great contribution to the Trump campaign. I think he deserves all the credit. And, uh, but his personality also got in the way. So when he got to the White House, he got into personal conflict with many people, including Trump's daughter, Ivanka, and uh, uh, Krishna. My observation to him is, uh, is, that, uh, is that he has a hard time to maintain relationship with other people. And uh, the ego always got into the way. So, well, to think of it, if you work in the White House, you invited reporters to the White House, you told reporters that, uh, you told them that the, the, uh, that the president's daughter and the son-in-law committed treason. I think that's very impeachable offense. And uh, I don't blame Trump kicking him out of the White House. So he only stayed there for a few months. And uh, uh, what I know is that he also did not understand what his role should be. Uh, well, sometimes people thought he might run for president or whatever. And another mistake he made was uh, 2017 when Jeff Sessions took the, the job at the Alabama uh, had the special election to elect another senator. And uh, I think at that time, Bannon was testing his power. He endorsed the candidate Trump, in the other candidate, you know, who was running, Roger Moore, who was running against Trump's candidate. And uh, eventually, actually Bannon won the primary just his candidate lost in Alabama. Can't believe it. And for that, I think he offended a lot of Republicans. When you watch his videos, his thoughts, it's, it's very, very articulate, like you said. But sometimes, you know, there is a, there is a saying in Sanskrit. Um, uh -huh. I, I'll say it and then I'll give you the meaning of that. We use it a lot in our debates. It's called Aham Brahmasmi. Uh, that means I am everything. See, this is a feeling, you know, it's sort of like a hubris feeling. I'm everything. I know everything. I know everything that needs to be there. 
I, I don't need to listen to you. So what if you have that kind of a feeling about yourself, sometimes this thing comes in the way of your progress, you know, the way you project yourself. Just just my thought again. So um, Trump had, um, who was the chief of staff when he came into power in 2016? It wasn't Mark Meadows, it was somebody else. No, no, no. Uh, uh, that was uh, uh, th th uh, uh, the Wisconsin guy, the uh, Rums Previous. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right, yeah. Right, right, right. Actually, I met him also many times and, uh, well, any, anyways, uh, as a reporter, <laughs> I met a lot of people. Yes, yes, stuff. yes, yes. As, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, viewers, we are going to have Sasha do a few more such interviews as, you know, the clock is beginning to wind up first for the 2022, you know, elections for the Congress and Senate, and then the 2024, where we expect to see some very interesting things come out of this presidential election. Now, U.S. presidential elections are fought across <laughs> the world. It's no longer in the U.S. alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's warfare. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, when so, you look at the election. So, Bannon yes. in the election actually picture himself as a general. He behaved like a general. Sometimes generals like a general pattern. <laughs> <laughs> They're heroes, but problematic men. Yes, 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 indeed. Those of you uh, who have uh, known or read about Patton, you should uh, read up Second World War because Patton was expecting to be what Eisenhower ended up to be for the Normandy invasion, I believe. And it was Eisenhower who got the job and not George Patton. Anyway, so just to give you some context there. Uh, Sasha, let's go back to uh, Bannon's yeah. view or shaping of the China policy. Yeah, and actually, that's why uh, in 2017, when I interviewed him, at 2018, the interview was, uh, if you look at, at that time, it was the peak of, or the beginning of, you know, the rhetoric wise of uh, Trump's China policy. Remember in 2017, Xi Jinping interviewed, uh, no, uh, remember in 2017, Xi Jinping came to the States. And Xi Jinping went to Mar-a-Lago and it was Trump and so you are, we are friends, brothers, whatever. But on the same, at the same time, Trump was launching this China policy, negotiating with China to get higher tariff. So anyway, 2018, we saw the entire, the, the Trump policy started, you know, China policy started to take effect rhetoric change and the policy be, be, began to change and at that time uh bannon was already out of the white house so i thought it was interviewed uh, i thought it was well time to interview him so i requested that interview and uh, the clip today the background of the interview my question uh the the, the question in my interview was Remember, Bannon left the White House in uh, August 2017. And a month later, in September 2017, he was invited by his friend John Thornton to Hong Kong and gave a speech there in Hong Kong. In that speech, he was quite positive about Xi Jinping. And um, after his talk, John Thornton uh, and his friends who are doing business in China asked him if he's interested in going to meet Wang Qishan, the number two guy in China. Most people believe it was, well, number two or even more powerful than number one, Xi Jinping. Because Wang Qishan, is the, well, at that time uh, was uh, vice vice president and vice a lot of wise, but he controlled the banking and investment banking industry. He also is quite close with Wall Street. And when Wall Street, if you work in Wall Street, Goldman Sachs, if you some banks like that, if you go to China, it's a lot more important to meet with Wang Qishan than meeting with Xi Jinping. That's how important the guy it was and still is. And um, in that time, people believed that some 
uh, power struggle between Wang and Xi. So Bannon was uh, invited to meet with Wang Qishan. Okay, um, I want to pause you for just one second. I want uh, our viewers to understand the power structure in China. So you have Xi Jinping, who is the general secretary and he's the equivalent of president of United States, the guy who actually signs, decides, blah, blah, blah. Then you have under him the vice president, which is Wang Qishan. Uh, and what about Li Keqiang? Where does he come in? No, at that time, Li Keqiang would... Uh... You know, here it's what title you have, what power you have, two different things. So if you look at Deng Xiaoping, he, he only holds one important title. He was the chairman of the military party military committee. That's all he needed. And then Li Keqiang was, well, I think that time he was, all, he was, uh, was, he was already the premier, but everybody knows he's a weak guy and he doesn't have Wang Qishan's kind of a connection and a background especially the connection with all the big banks and industry so that's what Wang Qishan said Li Keqiang well so far I don't see any investment bankers uh, would go and uh, uh, kowtow to Li Keqiang but they all kowtow to Wang Qishan that's the importance. And so, well, the, the guy kind of semi-retired in the past few years. Hmm. So did, did Bannon go and meet uh, Wang Qishan or he did not? He did. He okay. took the invitation. He met with two major guys, Wang Qishan and uh, Liu He. Liu He, is, uh, well, is the one who is in charge of the US-China trade negotiation. and. So let's listen to what Bannon said about Liu He and Wang Qishan about the meeting. And last time when I met you, you talk about your meeting with uh, Vice Premier, Vice President, or, or Vice Chairman <coughs> Wang Qishan. Would you tell us that story? Well, I just I went to Hong Kong to give a speech, and then it came about that he was open to meet in Beijing uh, shortly thereafter. So I went and had an opportunity to meet with him. I mean, he's one of the most influential people in the world, and so I consider it a, a great honor to, to, to meet him. It, it, it's no, um, it's no secret that I'm, you know, adamantly opposed to a lot of what the regime does. Um, and uh, but uh, we had, a, I thought, a, a very a good meeting, a long meeting. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, it's, and I consider him one of the most important people on the world stage. Anyway, so Bannon gave gave us the background, what happened, at, and see, here's the questions that he went to meet with the Chinese leaders and he you know everybody knows Chi Bannon was not that friendly to China he also knew he was the architect of Trump's not very friendly if not hostile China policy in that time so the meeting itself would be well i actually asked him a lot of those because it's on tape interview and uh, i asked him a few times how was the atmosphere are they friendly to you or you know in what and he said they were very friendly and uh, apparently they were trying to impress him that's my impression so how how much they impress him and how much you know what bannon think of him and the next answer is very interesting let's listen to bannon again question of him compared to say uh other world leaders and he's well he's one of the chinese leaders but he's sort of a, a little bit typical there and uh compared to say political leaders in the states What's your impression? Well, I think one of the things I took away and I've told people is that I'm very impressed with Li He and, and Wang Quishan and people like that, the depth of knowledge that they have about the United States. I mean, they have quite, they're quite, uh, they're quite knowledgeable about, and I don't so mean the politics of it, but they understand the economics, they understand the regions of the country, they understand uh, to a lot of granularity and specificity, uh, really what kind of makes the United States our economy Go. I don't see, in a lot of regards, um, uh, 
you know, that sophistication uh, here in, in Washington. I think, I think there's been a real lack of engagement and understanding, or that we have a lot of scholars, don't get me wrong, and we have a lot of some political people that are, you know, in the State Department and others, but I think there's been a fundamental misreading of what's happened in China in the last 20, 25 years. And I think now we're just awakening to that. A lot of the leadership, some of us, have, I think, have been, you know, uh, alert to that for quite a while. I'm considered one of the biggest China hawks. And it's not that I don't have a great love for the Chinese people. I do. And, and a great admiration uh, for China and, and, and the Chinese people. I just think there is a regime that is, uh, that is uh, you know, it's a totalitarian, mercantilist uh, regime. And uh, I think it's potentially going into areas that could be very dangerous. And, uh, and I've been very adamant about that. But Wang Kuishang and Li Hu and people like that are, and I think for other world leaders, it's, it's uh, something to, to, to look at. They are quite knowledgeable uh, about the United States and particularly the economy of the United States and the building blocks that they were also, he was also very, um, you know, I don't want to talk about that because it was a private meeting, but he, uh, he understands, you know, he understands American politics to a lot of degree. So I thought that that was quite, I think it's quite, uh, I think that's something really that's quite admirable in that. I think that's a very honest answer. And the several things I, I think I may want to remind people what he mentioned is uh, he thinks, well, I think he still think the same way now. I think the Chinese Communist Party is a totalitarian mercantilism. Mercant totalitarian mercantilist party what does what does it mean it's well when we talk about totalitarianism like soviet union and the communist countries and normally they did not care much about commerce and in fact one trait of communism is they destroy commerce but if you look at the chinese communist party look at china's economy that's not the case they care about commerce. They want to make money and make a lot of money. They did make a lot of money. So lots of Westerners have no idea how to categorize it. Is that capitalism or is that communism? If it's communism, why it pays so much attention to, the, to commerce? Why it's capitalism? Why, why such a strong state, ideological? So I think the, the, the term Bannon uses, it's quite a very useful reference. And uh, in private conversation, actually, I, I don't think that it's, it's that important. And why I did ask him details of what, what kind of politics they understand. And um, I said, give me one example. Uh, that's in, in another interview. I did not put it there. And he said, well, give one, me one example. He said, remember Tea Party? I was in Tea Party. And I said, well, uh, they actually asked him a lot about Tea Party. And he, what he said was, you know, interesting. He said for a long meeting, a couple of hours long meeting, they never asked him about Trump. They, but they ask him about the American people, Tea Party, Republic, Republican Party, local politics, and that really impressed him. My guess is the Chinese leaders, well, they knew asking about, asking about Trump would get nowhere. Well, he may give them some sort of a big, well, you can find in the newspaper kind of answer. Bannon's impressions that they are really interested and want to understand American society. And that's why he thinks you know, the Chinese leaders, of this Chinese leaders at least, are very sophisticated. Unlike, you know, people normally when you see in the US press and uh, it's sort of, uh, you give a picture of, uh, well, sort of rough and, uh, and even dumb kind of a picture and that's what he thought and um, um, well actually so I didn't ask him further we did, well the next next clip he and he explained the sophistication the level of sophistication in his eyes of the Chinese Communist Party party leaders always my impression that uh, 
the other leaders in other countries, especially the third world countries, understand America or American leaders a lot better than the other way around. And it's not only China. Do you think that's the case in your experience? It's, it's uh, you know, I've had an opportunity to meet, you know, s some of these world leaders and some of the people around them. Um, it's, yes, they do attempt to understand the West and particularly understand the United States. I just think with the Chinese, it's just at a different level. I mean, this was quite uh, sophisticated. Uh, you know, you could have a, a very engaged conversation with someone and it's at a level of detail and understanding that's not at other people's levels. And I think that that is something that is, uh, and I tell people here, I'd like to have us at that level of understanding. I think it's one of the things that I'm trying to do in Washington and with some of these organizations I'm involved with is that there has to be, uh, by, the, uh, by the working class people in the middle class, there has to be an awakening to really the reality of what's going on in China, particularly with the Chinese regime. You cannot depend upon just this foreign policy elite, uh, and particularly the Wall Street elite, because I think the Wall Street elite, by and large, many of them are in bed with the Chinese regime, and particularly corporate America is definitely in bed with the Chinese regime, and so to a large extent. So I think that has to, it's got to fall upon the people to really understand what's going on. I have the same impression. I talk to a lot of people, you know, famous scholars and sometimes officials that came from China. And, you know, if you, I think that might, must be the same in India. If you ask them about the question they ask you about the United States of America and all this, well, you, you would think any normal people know the U.S. Uh, compared to, well, in the U.S., the way they know China, everybody's the expert level in, in China. The reason is very simple. The Chinese are far more interested in, in the U.S. than the U.S. being interested in uh, China. And I used to write a newspaper column in uh, in the second largest newspaper in China. So I write one page, full page, on America every two weeks, and I got twenty million viewers, twenty million readers. Anyway, so the question, you know, I talk to my editors at in that side a lot. Ask them about what you're interested in 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 the States, what topic do you want me to cover? My, the feedback I got back from the China side was astonishing. Say, just, you know, turn that around if in the States, if I'm doing that from China and I'm talking to the, U, the US editor, and what kind of subject do you want me to cover? He was, oh, commerce in China, how uh, this or that. Uh, well, it's a very, they want, if you read the U.S., the new American papers, they're normally very generous subject. The request I got from China, for example, when I wrote about the campaign, they want to know the details, how you enter the doors, how you sign up to, uh, how, how you mobilize people. The Chinese absorb almost everything from the states for I mean, 40 years. The states, on the other hand, leave that to a few experts. And I'm sorry to say, if you look at the American experts, say Soviet experts uh, during the Cold War, they're scholars, they're analysts, they're experts, but they're not businessmen. If you look at the China expert nowadays, how many of them became businessmen? and serve business interest instead of serving national interest. That's a very big problem. And that it end up, you know, well, most of those people want to do business and uh, our country, especially China policy, end up ruled by a bunch of fools. I'm sorry to say that, but if you look at Washington, I am in Washington, I always wonder why are we ruled by a bunch of fools. <laughs> Good question. And uh, we have uh, the, well, let's move on to the next one, which yeah. is the, what was the foundation of Trump's China policy? 
I mean, you yeah. said that by by end of 2017, middle of 2018, levying tariffs was the only thing that the Trump administration figured would work against China. And I can understand why. China doesn't have mm -hmm. a lot of respect for intellectual property. They were copying things. Mm -hmm. They were stealing IP. And yet nobody was being compensated for that. So I understand all that stuff. So um, a little bit about how Steve Bannon saw the uh, the thing being rolled out. Give me a few examples of, like, for example, how what what Wang Qishan asked about you. Well, I don't. It's a, it's a private conversation, so I don't feel comfortable with that. But just let's say he knows he has a, a real understanding of the, the American economy, right? And I think to a to a to a quite you know, sophisticated level. I think you'd have a probably a more in-depth conversation with him than you could have with somebody really on Wall Street. You know, he's had his, his career has been, he's had a lot of experience in finance, a lot of experience in, 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 in with banking and, and other things. He's had been a very uh, intermediary with the West. But it's, um, you know, it's, um, as I tell people, the Chinese regime and the way that they have gained the system, because they have gained the system, uh, is very sophisticated. Uh, and, and, and these guys are very smart and they're very tough. And so we have to be just as smart and just as tough. I think with President Trump, that's what you're seeing. I think President Trump's an international businessman. He's very, very smart. He's extremely tough. He will not back down. And I think it's really the first time. And I take that from the Bush, Clinton, Bush and Obama administration and the foreign policy apparatus that essentially said, hey, the rise of China is this inexorable Rise of China is just the second law of thermodynamics and how it rises. Every, you can say Trump is tough and Trump is smart and that, well, at least I agree with that. But sophistication is the different word. I think in a way when Bannon described Trump and he also described himself <laughs> in a way in the China, in the China policy. And um, in a way, but if you look at this, how sophistication means first and foremost means you understand the other side of sophistication how china steal property rights and how china how china does things and i think you know well based on that you can have sophistication not the lefty intellectual argument said, on the one hand, on the other hand, I look at the culture, look, that's not sophistication. That's just excuse, excuses to be stupid. So in a way, I agree with Bannon on this. There's, uh, Trump's part, China policy is not only smart and tough, it has a level of sophistication. You know, we haven't, we haven't seen uh, it's uh, well. It's that's well. I got along with him uh, well <laughs> at that time. So okay. Thank you, yeah. Sasha. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, stop here for this part, and we're going to have a part two of a continuing continuing conversation with Sasha on her interview of Steve Bannon. This took place sometime in 2018, but it has never been aired before. So. Please do like, share, and subscribe to our channel and click on the bell button for notifications. And if you think that all the effort that Sasha put in, I'm just trying to you know, enable her, is worth it, please express your appreciation using the super thanks button.